With that, uh, we will go on to our next item, which is our 6.2 public hearing sitting as the Lake County Sanitation District Board of Directors approve and adopt an ordinance amending section 721C of the sewer use ordinance. Appendix A of the Lake County Ordinance Code increasing sewer use fees for all properties that discharge to the Middletown Wastewater Treatment Plant, excluding Anderson Springs. And we will um, welcome uh, Scott Harder, our Special Districts Administrator, and uh, Jesus Salmarin, Jesse Salmarin. Um, and the, the gentleman coming up, uh, sir? Uh, he is uh, Anthony. He's with the consultant that okay. the great analysis study. Anthony, what's the last name? Eluski. Okay, Anthony Eluski. All right, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, we are here today as part of the uh, Proposition 218 process. Uh, this is the public hearing part of the process. Um, this has been going on for a little bit of time. We contracted uh, through Cal World Water with Robert D. Niehaus Incorporated to perform a uh, revenue study, a cost of services study, and a rate analysis for our Middletown Sewer District. And Anthony's here to discuss that a little bit in detail. Um, Study was completed, it was reviewed, uh, it was brought to the board for consideration. We have noticed um, the, our customers uh, 45 days in advance uh, as required by Proposition 218. Uh, the notice for the public hearing was posted in the paper. And so today we're at the point of, of coming to you today and, and hearing input from the public, um, hearing feedback from the public for the proposed rates, um, reviewing the process overall, um, and then uh, evaluating where we are at as far as written protests. So for the Proposition 218 to succeed and the, and the proposed rates to be implemented, there has to be less than 50% written protests from uh, our active customers. We have approximately, well, no, I think it's exactly 522 customers at the time of the mailing, which is 50% uh, plus one puts us at 262 written protests. If we receive 262 written protests, uh, then we're not having a discussion about raising rates anymore. That, that's a moot point and we'd, we'd go on to figuring out how to manage the district without raising the rates. So um, with that brief introduction, I'll turn it over to Anthony. He's got a short presentation and then we'll answer questions you may have and then I suggest opening it up for the public hearing. No, it's really good to go. Uh, Kim it's might right drive it, I'm not sure. Good to go. <laughs> gotcha, thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, this is the Proposition 218 hearing, and thanks for letting me uh, present this information to you. Um, so some background on Proposition 218. He did mention the 50% plus one, but the proposition was originally voted to uh, allow local communities to have control over the... Um, implementation of different types of fees and rates that are uh, done by local agencies, utilities, for example. And just a few key points are that the revenues from the fees cannot exceed the funds equal to provide the service that the fee is being charged for. Fees cannot um, be used for any other purpose than for the one that the fee is being charged and the amount of the fee can't exceed the proportion, propor, proportional cost to any individual customer, so there has to be equity. And he mentioned the 45 days, and the notices themselves have to contain the date and location of the hearing, which is here, how to protest the hearing, and that's in writing, and the reason the fees are required. And valid protests will be counted at the end of the hearing. And so just some background on the district as I understand it. There's about 70,000 feet of sewer main, three lift stations, and there's currently 540 customers, mostly residential, a few multifamily and a few commercial. So the purpose of this rate study is to ensure that there's gonna be sufficient funding for the day-to-day -day operations for the Lake County Sanitary District Middletown branch that the rates that are developed are compliant with Prop 218, and those are the few items that I mentioned. They have to be equitable between the customer types. 
and project long term. And this is only a five year rate study, which is allowed under Proposition 218. So we provide a recommendation for five years of rate adjustments in this study. So briefly, your current rates, they're split up into a few different customer classes. There's residential, additional, which would be additional residential units beyond the first, motel rooms, restaurants, laundromat schools, beauty shops, service stations, which all the restaurant, those three commercial types are all currently being billed the current rate. Schools are per student, and short order was additional seats within a restaurant. When we looked at the current revenues based on the rates that you have currently set, we uh, projected around 170000 per year as far as revenues are concerned. It increases slightly because of potential customer growth. As far as the expenses based on the operating, and this is only the operating and maintenance expenses that we received, um, you're currently collecting about half of what is needed to fund the day-to-day -day operations of the district. And the negative balances increase because of current inflation. And when, at the time of the study, these are the uh, units of inflation that we projected. They are slightly lower than we're seeing currently based under the current inflation. However, we do think that they will return to normal levels in future years, so it should balance out. So currently, if we look at the future projection of this is cash on hand, it goes negative very quickly because of the uh, negative net balances seen in the budget. This produces no reserves, which is a key metric for uh, the future success of a utility system. It funds no capital projects, and eventually there's no money to continue maintaining the system whatsoever. So we recommended five years of adjustments because of the dire need, which we believe for the uh, adjustments. We front-loaded about 100% of initial first year adjustment, and then it goes down closer to the actual inflation rate after that. Um, this does fund operations, and by the end of the study period of five years, it will have contributed approximately 35,000 a year to capital reserves, and will reach a target of 10% of annual revenues. For the O&M reserve, and this shows the reserve funding, the target balances with the revenue adjustment. So the most important part to ensure that it's Proposition 218 compliant is to provide a cost of service analysis. And the cost of service analysis allocates the cost directly to each customer type based on the amount of uh, strain they put on the system. So we use, when we do these type of analysis, uh, numbers that are given by the State Water Resources Control Board as estimates. So the population count in each of the residential and additional are based on census data. So we found an estimate about 2.59 people per household. The state says that in general people uh, have about 50 gallons per capita per day of sewer flow. And if you go down the list here, you can see the count is the number of stays in the hotel room and the amount of flow that is, and this is annually, so it's half of the stay, basically, if they were half full. Restaurants have about 45 services a day, which generate about seven gallons per capita. And farther down the list, washers do about 100 gallons per day at a laundromat. And so when you look at the percentage of total flow on the right-hand side there, residential customers generate about 61% of the total flow, or I mean 81% if you include additional and then the second highest would be the school, which has a certain number of students who generate a certain number of flow per capita per day. Sewer strength is based on milligrams per liter of bio-oxygen demand in total suspended solids. The State Water Resources Control Board also gives estimates as to what each type of commercial property or residential property um, contributes to the system, and sewer strength is one of the main cost of service components 
because it's representative of the strain that individual types of customers put on the system. So the same analysis, if you multiply the contributed strength by the actual flow of the customers, then you get the percentage of the strength value on the right hand side. And again, because of this high amount of residential customers, they contribute the majority of sewer strength component to the cost of service, uh, with restaurant being the second highest because of the fats, oils, and get, uh, fats, oils, and grease, grease that they <laughs> put down the system that they contribute is uh, suspended solids. So once we do the allocation between all of the different types of customers, we get a total allocation of the required revenue. The required revenue basically equals the cost, the O&M cost to provide service, plus the, any capital expenses or other expenses and any reserve contributions that you have. So the total allocation is 81.7% residential, followed by the school, etc. down the list till we get to beauty shops which actually have a very small proportion of the total allocation and then you divide this amount by the number of bills and you get the allocated per bill and you do a bi-monthly bill so it would be $59 per residential customer every other month, $200 for restaurant, the service station, the $205 and the uh, units have stayed the same, so motel rooms are being charged 1182, schools per student 594 in the first year, and the laundromat is charged billed 40.19 per room. And Scott was uh, kind enough to put together this um, comparison of local sewer rates between Middletown, which currently would be 1630 a month and would increase to $29.68 a month for residential customers, which is still well below the regional average for similar service. Finally, just a few additional thoughts that districts cannot make a profit, so any rate increases are definitely needed based on the financial plan. If for some reason costs do not increase, the way that we're projecting or if additional funding can be found. If the board approves five years of rates now, at any time in the future, they can choose not to implement one of the rate increases. Proposition 218 only requires you to have them set ahead of time and that gives you a maximum. You could even increase them by less in the future if you decide that additional revenue is not needed. If you don't make this change now, if you don't implement these revenue adjustments, then you will actually just have to pay more in the long run to catch up with the deficit. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Anthony. Um, uh, one point that I didn't make earlier, and I think the board is aware of that, uh, the rates in Middletown have not been adjusted or changed since they were established in 1995. So we do recognize that this is a pretty dramatic increase, especially for the first year in the proposed rate structure, uh, but that is to catch up with the uh, operation that has been happening out of reserves and the deferred maintenance that has happened within the system. We're at a dire, a dire position and we really need these rates to offset where we're at and where we're going moving forward. Um, it's been 27 years since we've seen a rate increase. So yes, the first year's rate increase uh, for residential is proposed to go up 100%, but um, our PG&E costs since 1995 have gone up 200%. Our labor costs have gone up over 300%. We went back and looked at our, our costs you know, 27 years ago compared to what they are today. Um, and we've seen a significant increase on the cost side. So it's time to try and get the revenues to represent what we need to operate in a responsible fashion. Is there, um, <clears throat> is there any... Yeah, you can have to swear everybody in, right? Oh yeah, that's right. Um, I just had a quick question before we do the swearing. Um, is there any initiatives to 
uh, work on the PG&E costs, for example, any type of uh, solar or anything like that? We're always looking for ways to offset our, our PG&E costs. Awesome. PG&E is one of our largest costs, that and labor. Mm -hmm. um, pumping um, happens 24-7 to move the, the wastewater to the processing plant, which then also operates 24-7 typically to process that waste stream. But, um, yeah, we have solar in the system already. We are looking... Uh, we tried unsuccessfully to um, secure some uh, SGIP funding for batteries to okay. help uh, shift the time of use in our PG&E costs, but we're always looking for ways to reduce our costs. You read my mind. That was my next question, so we'll go from there. All right, so uh, <coughs> anything else from the board? I think we have Supervisor Green. Yeah, this may have been outside the scope of the study. I imagine it was, but uh, City of Lake Bore recently did both their water and their wastewater uh, rates, and the study there... Um, uh, comparing and contrasting, or maybe a city mouse, country mouse kind of thing, but uh, the list of commercial uh, rates seemed pretty granular. I mean, from booty, uh, beauty shops to gas stations, whereas in the uh, the rates we just adopted in Lakeport, um, basically they said it was commercial, and then came up with two tiers of basically heavier uses and light uses, uh, and and residential they parsed between. Um, uh, meter sizes uh, and the type of residential unit, so different rates for, uh, for example, uh, apartments in a multifamily uh, uh, situation as opposed to a single family residence. So I know it probably wasn't part of the rate study to examine the commercial side of things and how granular it was and if those charge throughs made a lot of sense, but is this type of granularity common among I don't know, I don't want to say, but modern <laughs> modern uh, uh, wastewater studies. Because, uh, again, we haven't updated the rates since 95. It's pro we probably haven't taken a look at the rate structure itself since 95. So I just wonder if there's a, it probably wasn't part of the rate study per se, but is this common? So it, it is very common to have multiple use categories for commercial customers. Uh, the increased granularity increases the equity between types of customers. Um, what was the second half of the question? It, as far as residential customers, we weren't, the census had the same amount of people per type of residence for uh, multifamily as well as um, at least close enough between multifamily and single family residential in Middletown as far as population per household. So that was the number that we used for yeah, residential, and there wasn't enough variety to justify having two different types of residential customer class. Okay, thank you. To add a little bit more to that too, um, because this is not water-based, it's wastewater-based, we weren't concerned with looking at water meter size. Uh, we don't have the water district in Middletown, that's a, a separate utility district, so um, basing sewer usage on water meter size wasn't really relevant in this, in this particular case. Um, and also in some of our other sewer districts, uh, as you noted, we have more modern rate structures, and there are like high strength commercial, medium strength commercial, low strength commercial, so we see that. But we also do see the granularity by um, end user type as well, because that tends to influence the strength and quantity of the waste flow. All right, Supervisor Sabati, then Supervisor Simon right after. Yeah, I got a quick question. <clears throat> uh, I don't see it anywhere as far as the rules and regulation for 218, but it was an interesting comment that we all received. Uh, is there any um, mandatory uh, need to provide uh, bilingual uh, notification since we do have people who live in the area that do not speak English uh, but yet have the same rights to either protest or approve this or provide comment or anything like that. Just, just curious. I don't see it um, within the law, but uh, just wanted to ask. No, there's there's not a legal requirement. In some of our, our other mailings, uh, depending on the threshold of population, there are certain requirements for utility um, districts or utility companies. We don't meet those thresholds currently in Middletown. Um, and we do have uh, bilingual translators in in the office and on staff, and, and we have not experienced any issues communicating with our Spanish-speaking customers uh, historically. Okay, and I also looked at your um, notification that you provided us in the attachments. Uh, I didn't see anything that said if you need translation, just hoping in the future that either A, we can provide a bilingual notification just to make sure that the large majority of people 
know exactly what they're receiving or at least something that says for translation contact because I didn't see that in there. So yeah. uh, just my suggestion for the future to make sure that we get as many people involved and to participate to say yes or no. Supervisor Simon. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. I, I completely agree with that suggestion in the future as we move forward with it. I will say uh, just a comment. You already answered it on the meter size on the uh, water. Obviously, uh, there has been a rate increase with Calumet Water District. I think in the past five years, uh, somewhere in that area, uh, there were some you know some processes that went through, and you know so so it's been done. Um, like I've said before, as we hear the comments today and everything, there is no good time. Uh, to raise fees, um, but this is a conversation that's needed. It's been a long coming Something hopefully we learn as a board and as we move forward that uh, Putting something in and, and and not taking the necessary steps over time Really compounds the pain that's felt by the customers and just learning from example here as we move forward as a board that That we do these we look at these fees. We look at these things that are looked at every five years I think that's what we got going forward here. So I think we're moving in the right direction. We do have a new uh, sewer district down in our area too, which mm -hmm. is Anderson Springs. So as long as we stay on that path and look at those things that um, You know, hopefully we can ease the pain of these uh, like I said again raising fees is Never the easy discussion, but it is something that we need to do to operate these facilities. So that's all I have. All right, so from uh, from there we'll go ahead and uh, do the swear-in And if there's anybody online that to swear -in. no, we don't Oh, no, often, generally for public hearings, you will, but this is a protest hearing, so swearing in isn't necessary. Oh, thank you, Anita. And so um, with that, then we'll go ahead and open public input and uh, go from there. So uh, do you have a comment or you would like to come up and say something on this item? Um, <coughs> state your name for the record, and we'll start your three minutes, and uh, we'll go from there. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Julia Bono. Um, I wish to ask a number of questions. Uh, first of all, I'd ask, like to ask why this huge 120, oh, and, and I should just mention that I represent 50 people uh, who have uh, signed um, protest letters uh, and which I, I had personally delivered here to the office. Um, uh, I could have had many, many more than 50 if we'd have had a little bit more time, but unfortunately we had very inclement weather over the weekend and we, we had that many uh, that I was able to personally uh, oversee. Um, so I'd like to ask why this huge 120% uh, increase is being proposed to add um, an, an upgrade of 1,277 equivalent dwelling units to Middletown's waste management facility when the report's own estimate that we've seen is for a growth of less than 100 EDUs over a 10-year period until 2031, as shown in figure three. Um, that's my first question. Um, I also see no mention in the um, financial plan of historical data that we can use to put the projections shown in figure eight of losses into any kind of perspective. If we don't know where we've been, how can we assume that your projections are even, you know, in the right trending direction? Um, I think along those lines, uh, um, I think we, we had said that a portion of the, uh, rate rise will be going to build the utilities reserves. Um, but this will just be taking money out of Middletown's households' pockets when they need it most to combat recent cost of living increases. This comes at an absolutely horrendous time. I've spoken to so many people, and my husband, Carlos, who is bilingual, has spoken to many Hispanic people who did not know about this, who were not informed, who could not read the notice letter, and so were, you know, when we presented it to them, thankfully he was able to do so in Spanish, they were horrified. We also spoke to many, many renters who were... Um, uh, not able to get their landlord's signatures on these things fast enough. The landlords might have been out of the state or they might have been not responsive in the sort of time frame that we needed their letters to be produced by. So by not allowing renters who are going to ultimately be footing the, the, the cost of these increases to have a say in this protest, we're cutting out a large portion of the people who would otherwise have protested this, this increase. Uh, finally, I would like to... Um, 
lodge a complaint about the need to protest this rate rise in writing rather than electronically. This is onerous. Um, people have to pay for posters. They were, you know, they, they have to, there has to be a time frame for delivery. You know, we, we could have done this electronically. We're in the modern era now, you know, things can be done electronically. This was also have helped with getting some of the landlords to participate and for people to being able to uh, get uh, a link sent to them via email. Uh, is that my time? Yes. So I, I'd like those questions up. answered, please. Thank you. So, uh, is it, are we responding? I don't know. Uh, yes. Well, maybe we can move forward with a couple more if you think that we can address all of them at the same time, you think? Or would you rather just address it right now? I can respond, yeah, I think, as best as I can, if I can recall them all. Um, there was mention about the the potential 1,076 uh, EDU growth. Um, and that is a separate, unrelated capital project, which is uh, entirely grant-funded. Uh, if this rate increase goes through, that will demonstrate to the state that our revenue stream is stable for this district, um, and then they will award a $5 million grant for plant improvements. Uh, the population projections within the rate analysis were based on um, current growth trends, which we were seeing about you know, 2 to 2.5%. Two so that was those. Um, Gosh, I'm struggling to recall. And as far as the uh, renters and as far as the uh, way to protest, I uh, think that's within the law of Prop 218 that we have to follow. Correct, exactly. Those are all within the, the Proposition 218 and the, the California Code, so we are complying with that. Um, as far as uh, noticing requirements, how far out in advance we provide notice, uh, the way that the response has to come in. So, yes, those are all in compliance with California law. All right, so with that, uh, is there anyone in the chambers? I think there was one more uh, historical data. I think that was another question. Oh, for the, yeah, for the trend, I think uh, that Anthony's chart showed um, dipping into revenues and then being out of money. Um, so we have provided uh, the consultant our, our historical budgets, our, our analysis, our, our numbers for past and moving forward. So that's how we based those cost of services, that rate analysis, that fiscal analysis was, you know, what has the dust district been operating? What are the operating expenses? Uh, what are the revenues uh, under the current rate structure? What are they projected to be under uh, the increased rate structure? So. And as well, the inflation, as it said on the slide, is based on uh, CPI data from the BLS and construction cost index, which are reputable inflation sources. Yeah, those are also the ones that we use uh, for some of our other rates, which are tied to either a CPI or our, uh, our capacity fees are charged or they're tied to a um, uh, construction cost index as well. So, okay. All right. Sir, if you'd like to come up, yes. State your name for the record and we'll start at three minutes. Yes, my name is Carlos Bono. <clears throat> I uh, live in Middletown and I'm, I'm a bilingual. I'm Mexican and American, I have dual nationality. I uh, have been spending a lot of time with the Mexican community. Middletown is now predominantly Hispanic. Just, I did not find one person that spoke Spanish that had received the, the letters that were supposedly sent. And if they did receive them, they probably didn't read them. I, uh, I talked to mo many people on the street. I got them to sign uh, letters of protest. Unfortunately, um, most people are renters and we would have needed more time to have them present the letters of protest to their landlord and to deliver them here. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if 540 letters were sent. I, I doubt that, but um, I think more time would be needed to make the, uh, the protest effective for uh, the Middletown community, which is now predominantly Hispanic. Another thing is that a bond was paid. When, when I moved to, to Lake County in 2002, a bond was paid off and I was under the impression from the people that I was paying the mortgage to that the uh, sewer rates would, the sewer would, would eventually go away. The, the payment for the sewer, uh, we would get a nominal um, payment because of the payment of this bond. Now, I don't know the truth of this matter. I have not researched it in depth, 
but I think it's something to look into. I think that may be one of the reasons that the uh, district was not uh, predisposed in raising rates right away. They wanted to maybe uh, let people forget about the bond payment. At any rate, um, that's all I have. And I would really like the consideration of the Mexican community in this because they have absolutely no, I mean, they have no recourse and they can't really say much if they don't have somebody to uh, represent them. At any rate, that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Just, I'm quick, trying. To. Quick point of clarification, if I could, from staff. Uh, uh, those people eligible to protest, in, in many cases, where I, I'm hearing about renters and especially in apartment buildings. Who got noticed in a uh, multifamily setting? Is it the apartment owner and that is the only person allowed to protest or are individual uh, people who uh, absorb those pass-through costs from the property owner? Uh, do they have protest rights as well? Uh, it's the property owner and, and legally within the district the property owner is ultimately responsible to pay So in the situation where there are renters if the renters default the district has the ability to place a tax lien against the property It's the property owner who's ultimately responsible for the bill and they have protest rights Thank you. And also each parcel is only allowed one protest So in a multi-family unit if there's 30 rentals, there's still only one protest allowed per rental unit. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I see a hand up in the... Go ahead. Come on up. Yes. Joan, if you'd like to come up. Joan Moss. I want to know if Middletown's population has increased or decreased. I want to know what allowances are made for those who send treated wastewater up to the geothermal wells. Does Middletown participate in this? I want to know how many people in Middletown are employed by the geothermal development. And I want to know how the low-income people are treated as opposed to the high-income people. I just don't see this as being fair or equitable. We all use the bathroom. We all are different. I don't think this is any way a 420 rate increase. It's unbelievable that there wouldn't be, with all the emergency funds available, with all the drought. Do you have a drought management plan, sir? Is there any consideration of the drought that is in effect, even though we have the rains? And is this a program sponsored by the California Department of Water Resources? I just heard about this today and I'm just mentioning some things to consider. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, population in Middletown, I have no idea. If it's gone up for I don't have that answer either. I'll try and get that for uh, Joan, obviously, since the Valley Fire. Uh, you, you know, I think there was, when we did redistricting, there was some changes that were made. So um, I don't have that information. Maybe uh, Bruno's looking at data, uh, so he may have an answer. Um, I just do want to say that there is not a 420% increase. Um, yes, there is an increase that is going to happen, but... Uh, if you could get that it, out there correctly. It's roughly 100% correct, yeah, for Thank residential you. customers in the first year. Okay. I believe it's 116 and a half. Yeah. We uh, want to okay. be specific over the course of the next five years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
just want to check in on that. And, and if uh, the board doesn't mind, I am looking at 2020 census. Uh, for Middletown, California, says between 2019 and 2020, the population of Middletown, California declined from 739 to 725, 1.89% uh, decrease. And it also states that 9.24% uh, of the population is Hispanic. And to address uh, some other Jones questions or comments. And, that, and I'm sorry to interrupt. That doesn't denote if you're Hispanic that you only speak Spanish. Right. Uh, that just denotes your uh, uh, answer on the census of what your ethnicity is. Ma'am, if you're going to speak, please come to the microphone. We can't take like statements from the back of the room. So if you come up and you want to restate something, we'll give you a short, brief time and, and, to, to make a statement. And so, Joan, you have a couple seconds. Go and ahead. if I may before, I want to know if about I may federal before, lands, if federal, I may if one I, second, Joan, if, 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 if I may before, Joan, then, let him speak and then I'll let you speak. I so. believe it says 91% is non-Hispanic white, 90.8% is non-Hispanic white. And again, this is the 2020 census. Just wanted to provide I that I also data. wanted to mention the Native American population on federal land. Are they considered differently? Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Go ahead, Supervisor. Well, no, I can answer that directly for the Middletown Rancheria. No, we're, we're, uh, I hope we're not considered differently um, But uh, as we move through it. But we are part of the um, locus. You're a customer. We are yes. a customer. All, right. All of our residents on the Rancheria and also our businesses. Ma'am, come on up. Yes, we pay the same rates. 20, 20, come to the microphone, ma'am. Come to the microphone and speak into it so we can is hear. Not 2022. All, uh, 2022, we have a very significant Hispanic population in Middletown. Uh, a lot of them are renters, and you can't go by the census data because sometimes they don't mention their ethnicity on the census reports. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, is there anyone from the public that has more to say on this item? And I'm looking online. Is there anybody online? You have somebody? No. Okay. All right. I'll bring it back to the board and we'll move forward from there. Obviously, just want to make sure, you know, uh, we had the public comment conversation on uh, as, as we move forward with this. So we, we, we did uh, get from Linda Deal Darms the, the request to propose postpone this for 30 days at this time I, I, I am personally I am not prepared to do that as, as, as district one supervisor I appreciate the process we've gone through but I would like to have some discussion with the board as we went through this process 100% increase I know where we want to get to so I want to have a conversation with the board if we could talk about incremental steps as we move forward through that process that's really um, what I'd like to address with the board and if I can go directly to those I will try to pull that up it was uh, proposed to be a hundred percent the first year six percent the second year and then three and a half percent I think the next couple of years I'll let me pull that up really quickly I think it's the next yeah. three years after that next three years okay and and just if you do an incremental uh, yeah. more balanced rate increase you do have a higher overall increase uh, because you're going to be making up for that lost revenue in the first year. Um, the 100% also was chosen because of the very rather large negative net balance, even in this current fiscal year. Um, you're collecting about half of the revenues we project of what you need to fund operations. So <clears throat> if you do do a longer term, uh, more looking, balanced was, rate increase. Was not looking for a longer term. Not, I mean, a more balanced, say, 50%, 50%. 40%, 30%, just numbers, you will have a higher end rate at the end of five years than you will if you um, do a higher increase initially. We're, for, how, does, how does that work? So, so you begin an earlier that. comment was we, we're not sure where we're going, 100% sure where we would be in the five years. Things could change and we could look at rate adjustments at three years from now, things could change. It could be lower than anticipated. So just if you clarify. You, you can that decrease more. rates anytime as the Board of Supervisors. You just can't increase them past the amount that is recommended. Um, we believe that our projections are accurate. So 
in, in the fact, in the case that they are accurate, then we believe that these are the rate adjustments that you will need. Oh. And okay, just so if you did a more gradual increase, mm -hmm. then you've got the time value of money over that five years. So it, it's going to end up at the end of the five years, the monthly rate or the bi-monthly rate is going to have to be higher to account for the fact that you didn't have that increase in that additional revenue coming in at the beginning of this five-year series. That, that's what Anthony's saying. So that was a consideration when we looked at the various types of, of rate structures to move forward and put forward in the recommendation. Um, one of them had a more gradual increase. However, it ended up with the end user, the customer, paying more on their monthly or bi-monthly bill um, to still get to the same point at the end of the five-year period. And we're going from 16... 32 to 29 or 1636 to 2936 monthly or, or monthly but we buy we bill bi-monthly so they will yeah. see a 5936 bill okay. every other month all right okay let me hear some discussion from the i believe mike man yeah. yeah supervisor green go ahead yeah we had similar questions again when they court did their rate study <clears throat> And correct me if I'm wrong, if we tweak the rates too much, we kind of lose integrity of the rate study as a whole. But I think one of the reasons the big increase comes up front is we have zero reserve here, it sounds like. And so getting that first chunk of funds in that first year is, is mission critical, not only to uh, meeting the district's expenses, but trying to meet the goals of, of what is actually required to have a capital reserve and, and to uh, be a healthy district. Uh, I do get that there's sticker shock. I do also understand and I want to reinforce the point that it's been nearly 30 years since these rates have been adjusted. Um, although the increase is scary in terms of the percentage, the overall rates are not out of not out of whack in any way with what modern utilities are going for. And if I recall right, there's now a legal requirement that we have to come back every five years and do a rate study so we can avoid the very type of situation we're facing here today. Is that correct? Yeah. All right, so I appreciate that there's concern over some sticker shock. Um, just as I support it in Lakeport, sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and do what's right. Um, I, I'm satisfied with the methodology of the study, and I'm satisfied with the proposed rates uh, in the way that they are proposed. Supervisor Sabatier. I appreciate Supervisor Simon asking for discussion on what can we do to make this a little bit more palatable, because while the money amount might be small, it's still asking for taking more out of people's accounts in a time period where it's difficult to have more in our bank accounts. Um, I also agree that there's never a good time to make an increase, but over the course of the last 27 years, had there been this 2% or 3% increase, we wouldn't be here at all looking at this large number. And so uh, obviously rectified in the future so that this doesn't happen again. Uh, but this is definitely, in a way, our doing by waiting so long to get to this point of uh, recreating the rate structure. So here we are. Um, while, do you have an idea? I know Supervisor Simon mentioned maybe 50% and then looking at another increase the following year. Do you know what the overall percentage might look like? You said it would be more. Is it 120? Is it 130? Is it 125? What is the overall percentage that would be the increase if we did reduce um, and kind of make that 100 staggered a little bit more than just happening in one single year? Uh, I'm not certain Anthony might have a, a wild guess or, or a recollection. Yeah, but, no, um, I'd have to actually type it up. Yeah, and my the understanding numbers, of the process, and I think uh, Supervisor Green spoke to this, if we futz with this too much, we, we futz with the integrity of the study. Um, what I would see or what I envision if, if the board is looking to ease into the rates in a more gradual fashion, um, we're not going to recoup what was recognized as what was needed for that five-year period. So uh, the rate structure as presented in the analysis provides for some rebuilding of the reserves. Um, if we gradually eased into this, I imagine that we could look at, you know, what is the, the dollar amount for the first year, and instead of going that to that full dollar amount, you go to maybe 60% of it. Second year, you maybe go to 80% of the record rate, recommended rate, and maybe by the third year, you're at 100% of that recommended rate structure. Overall, that ends up leaving a shortfall in the five-year period. 
but I think that doesn't um, disturb the integrity of the rate analysis. It just means that we have to burn a little more reserves as we're building back up to a, a rate that can support operation of the system. And, and you're looking at $35,000 maximum, or was that minimum per year to be placed into the reserves? I think that's what we were planning. Uh, was it minimum a, or maximum? It was maximum, I think. Maximum? Yeah, it was, it was based on getting us back at the end of the five-year period up to a healthy reserve. So potentially, if there is an <clears throat> urgent situation, you may be missing 70000 or maybe 105000 or something like that at the most, is, is that, that we may miss if we don't hit the hundred and then six and then 3.5, 3.5. Um, and that's, again, an if you have to use it in the sense that it requires a specific uh, requirement of you to have to use those reserves for that. Right. It, if it's something that Supervisor Simon would like to see, and if the board obviously is interested, I, I'd love to see what that looks like to tweak the percentages a little bit rather than kind of have an estimate of what that would look, uh, look like. Because obviously we're, we're being told, and it makes sense, that if we don't do 100% on year one and then so on and so forth, that you end up missing out on the recovery that's supposed to happen based on, on the fact that the fees are so low that there is no recovery. It's all at a loss every single year. Um, so eventually you'll get a 120% increase rather than the 116 and a half, or maybe it's more of an increase. I'd like to know what that looks like if we choose to go that direction rather than discussing it in a way that I can't have a tangible uh, view of what that impact would be. Because if it's gonna be 170% in the long run, now that's a much bigger impact that I, I would be against for that community to be impacted by such an increase, but if it's gonna be just a slight increase and overall you get 120% versus 116 and a half and you don't have to hit that same hurdle the first year, then I think that would be a debatable uh, situation of what's the best way to move forward. Uh, but without that in front of me, it's hard for me to make any guess as to how we move forward other than just what's been presented to us today. I understand, and, and like I said though, I think and I'm not sure I'd probably defer to county council on this. I would think that if we were proposing something, essentially restructuring this rate analysis, I'm not sure if that restarts the whole process. Yeah, you do have to do another Proposition yeah. 218 hearing. So because if we were looking to ease more increase. gradually into this, my recommendation would be that we just, we look at the, the dollar amounts for the first year, the second year, third year, implement those at a percentage. But at the end of the five years, we're not exceeding what the maximum recommended rate is. So we are not exceeding the analysis and the study that's already been done. We don't have to go through the process again because we've recreated a new rate analysis. We have just implemented what has been approved um, and what has been analyzed and, and is consistent with, with state law. We've implemented it at, at a lower level. As Anthony indicated, you at the board, if revenues were coming in higher, you at any time can implement at a lower level. You just can't exceed the level that's been so, identified. Supervisor Simon, I, I don't know if we wanted to need it. Did you have something before Supervisor Simon? Real briefly? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to adjust in any way where the rates would, would be increased, where the fees, where the total amount paid by the rate payers would be increased, I'd strongly recommend a new 218 process to describe that methodology. If you're doing what Mr. Harder says, where you're not changing anything except a percentage reduction, um, he's correct that if you if you reduce the fees in the 218 process, you're fine, but you may not increase them in any way. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Well, I appreciate the conversation today. You know, this has uh, been a long coming. We've had natural disasters that have happened since 2015, um, the Valley, you know, the Valley Fire, you know, so. We're years out. I, you know, um, when I first came on board, I know that uh, this was one of the issues that, that was brought to me by your uh, uh, Jan Coppinger, who sat in your position before you. And, um, you know, but there was never a good time, especially during disasters. Some of the worst times in people's lives, and they're still rebuilding from it. You know, I made a statement earlier um, that pushing things down the road. I appreciate the conversations that we've had today. Believe me, as I said, I'm a ratepayer on this same system. 
100% increase is, is never what you want to hear. You want to have those conversations. But kicking it down the road is not something I want to do either. I don't want to leave that as something, if I'm not here after the next term or the following term, that is not left for another supervisor to address this in the way that I'm being asked to do this at this point. So um, with all those questions you know, being asked, uh, my concerns, uh, hearing the explanations and where we're going, I think um, Supervisor Green said it the best. Bite the bullet, move forward, set the line, and look to go forward in that manner in the future here, especially in our district area. So that's that, that's where I'm at, you know, just in the conversations. And it's not easy. To, no, I closed public comment, ma'am. Okay. So I closed public comment. Sir, I'd like to respond to some of the, uh, my, my question did not get answered. I asked a question about why we needed 1,277 EDUs when Growth is only projected to be 100 EDUs over a 10-year period, and we're going to be paying for those EDUs, whatever that, that facility that's going to be built. He says it's going to be built with a grant. That's fine, but it's it's people to run it or whatever. The, the yeah, I know. I'm, no one has to answer this question So because she's that. not stopping. She's not stopping, and she's not supposed to talk. So nobody has to answer that question. Supervisor Sabatier. I, I, it is. You should have said it during public comment. No, you. All right, ma'am. Yes, We're not going to have a back and forth. I have it on tape. All right, I, I, it's on tape here as well. I, I do want to say that. So we approved the final report. I don't remember. It's been a little while, and I get all the weeks. The twenty second. Yeah, we did it on the twenty second. <laughs> but we approved the final report that we're also it's it's in our attachments, um, and I thought that I. I maybe didn't ask the right questions, um, but I thought this was going to be the day to potentially have a discussion about the rates. And I feel somewhat cornered that it's almost like we can't change the rates or else I'm asking you to start all over. And, and at what, I, I'm, my question is, at what point is the right time to question was that during the final report? Because I was told that was not the right time at that point to, to question because it wasn't, it was about the reporting process in creating the final report, not the specifics of what was going to be proposed to the public. What is the right time? Because I'm feeling like I'm being pulled away some of the choices that I feel that we should have. Um, that the public wants us to hear talking about, but at the same time saying that uh, now we're just asking for you to restart. Uh, so what is the appropriate time to discuss the report's suggestion of the rate increases prior to it coming here and feeling like it's a static thing? When the report was reviewed, it would have been the proper time to discuss having a different rate structure presented. However, at this point in time, we can still discuss rates, and, and I'm open to the board's consideration of adoption at a lower rate. But as Anita pointed out, and as I've said, we can't go above what the report identifies. Um, you know, the, the report has to set rates based on anticipated operating costs, and there is um, a portion of that rate that goes to fund and rebuild reserves. So if the board was uh, considering the the public input and was considering the impact that the 100% upfront in the first year had and was not comfortable implementing it at, at this recommended structure, then they have the, uh, the ability and the liberty to recommend rates at a lower percentage. And if that's the board's wish, then I'm 100% on board with that. We will operate out of reserves a little bit longer and it will take us longer than the five years possibly to rebuild our reserves, but we will still continue moving forward and the impact to the downstream customers will be lessened as we transition into this. And, and a follow-up, um, <coughs> two, two follow-up questions. One right now we're looking at 116.5 total. Is that what we can't go above? or we can't go above the 6% and the 3.5%? Uh, I would say it's probably safe to back away from percentages. What we can't go above are the recommended monthly or bi-monthly rates. Fixed dollars are a lot easier to deal with than percentages. Percentages get skewed when you start <laughs> manipulating and maneuvering them around. So the rate has, has looked at 
fixed dollars of operating expenses and cost of services and has recommended fixed dollars to recover those those expenses so if we stay below the the rate in a dollar value at any given point in the five-year rate analysis we are okay we cannot propose going above the dollar value any of those numbers that have been identified okay and then my last question is um Slip my mind. Supervisor um, Simon, you're following uh, this last no. question. Yeah. You don't have anything else? No. Okay. Yes, your uh, reserves. How long has it been since you've not had any reserves there? Is it just this not, year? We're not empty, but we're low. We've been operating um, out of them for a few years now. About five years. And this came up during the budget. I think we used 160 or 130,000 out of reserves in the last fiscal year. Okay. And I will uh, make one final statement looking at the average household income in comparison to the district that I serve uh, in the city of Clear Lake and seeing that I pay 87 and might even be $88 now uh, every two months uh, in comparison to what's being proposed for Middletown, which has a much higher household income. Uh, obviously, it can be afforded. It's it's the matter of readjustment, and so that's why I'm continuing the conversation of uh, looking at the reduction. Uh, but at this moment, I um, I'm going to uh, and I appreciate Supervisor Simon take the lead on this one. I appreciate that statement, Supervisor Sabatier, because I, I noticed the current rates, and then I I see the proposed rates, and I know in my district it is the same amount as the proposed rates, and so. Um, there's, a, there's a myriad of people with the same type of predicament of fixed incomes and whatnot that are currently paying that there. I don't, I don't object to uh, an incremental, you know, uh, incremental if that's the, the direction, but otherwise I do know that uh, the, the same statement that Supervisor Sabatia made was, is prevalent in, in, in my district as well, so just wanted to state that. All right. Uh, Supervisor Green, did you have one, uh, another statement? or Just ready to make a motion. Oh, but it's uh, it's his district. Most of the time, we we allow the district supervisor to make the motion of the object on the agenda for them. Is there anything that needs to be done before Nidor? Protest tabulation. Oh. I can speak to that. Um, so there were 85 verified um, protests to the hearing today. And that's jo Johanna DeLong, yeah. Can I ask for a clarification? 85 out of how many parcels? 522 were sent out. Thank to, you. To active property owners, sewer customers. All right, completed, okay. Mr. Chair, sitting as the Lake County Sanitation District Board of Directors, uh, or do I just offer the E? No, sir, I, you're, you're right to sit as the Lake Sand Board of Directors. Uh, for the adoption of the ordinance, I'd recommend two readings. First, a motion with first a motion to waive reading and have it read in title only. So moved. Second. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Oh, I have it here. I can do it. Okay. An ordinance amending Section 721C of the Sewer Use Ordinance, Appendix A of the Lake <coughs> County Ordinance Code, increasing sewer use <coughs> fees for all properties that discharge to the Middletown Wastewater Treatment Plant, excluding Anderson Springs. And then there'd be a motion to... Uh, advance for a second reading, and that could be for the 13th if your board selects that date. We need a time certain for that? Or? No, sir. So moved. Second. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And for a point of clarification, these rates will go into effect in February of 2023. All right. That, that covers everything? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you for the presentation, and uh, we appreciate this. We're going to go ahead and uh, break shortly, um, and we'll come back at 1025.